Hello, this is a chat for the Family Nurse Practitioner about health promotion. Um, in studying for your boards, you've probably noticed that there are quite a few health promotion questions and they're not necessarily how you think that they would be. So this is just going over a few varied topics that are going to be ideal for your board exams. Okay, so one of the first things that comes up in life in terms of health promotion is that we need to be able to tell family members how much to feed the baby. This is not at all complicated when you're breastfeeding your baby and we all know that breast is best. However, we are gonna have those moms who are unable to feed their baby by any other means. So for those babies, we're gonna to want to consider how much formula they should be getting. And it's not necessarily just how much formula, but how often should, they, should you be feeding them? So for as soon as your baby's born, you're gonna be doing six to eight feedings. That's pretty different from breakfast, lunch, dinner. You know, they're gonna be eating pretty constantly. And a good way to think about this is that by about one year, you're gonna have them on a breakfast, lunch, and dinner kind of a routine. Now you, you could do more, but you definitely don't have to, and this is gonna be the typical feeding schedule. And the number of ounces can seem, you know, a little bit complicated. I just want you to consider that eight ounces is probably the most you're gonna be doing for your baby, and that is because a bottle is eight ounces. There aren't many baby, many, there's not really any size baby who's gonna be able to drink more than a bottle in one sitting. Now, um, here I have a regular size bottle showing eight ounces for you all, and also just want to consider the birth weight. So the baby's, the number of pounds that your baby is, you're going to want to divide that by two, and then that's how many ounces you should be feeding them every about three to four hours. Now, like this shows, you can condense it over time, but this is just kind of a good rule of thumb to know how much your baby should be getting. Usually babies aren't going to overeat, but they can definitely undereat. So this is a good thing to keep in mind if you feel like your baby's not gaining weight or something along those lines. And there are a few other rules about what else you should be giving your baby, and it's definitely no cow's milk for the first year. The reason for that is that you need iron, linoleic acid, vitamin E, and high protein. There's not as much protein in cow's milk, there's not as much iron in cow's milk, and there's not any linoleic acid. That's something that only humans make, and definitely not as much vitamin E. If there is any in cow's milk at all, I'm not sure. The other thing to, cons to keep in mind, at least for the boards, is that you aren't going to want to recommend giving whole food until after six months and that's introducing one or two items um you know every month one item at a time and starting with baby rice cereal but in in general there's no real reason why you can't give your your baby human you know whole human food when they tolerate it it's just that most babies are going to tolerate it before six months they may, and if they are interested in your own practice, that's okay, as long as they're getting enough breast milk. The longer that they're having breast milk, the better. And this is just something that I saw on USMLE shortcuts, and this kind of helps me to remember the immunization portions. There's going to be a lot of questions about, you know, you have a six-month-old coming in, what kind of immunizations do they have? So you can see that pretty quickly, you know, in the first year, we're doing a ton of vaccines. At birth, we're just giving the Hep B. At two years, we're giving Hep B, DTaP, rotavirus, H influenzae, polio, and pneumonia. That's 2B Dr. Hib. 4 Dr. Hib, Hip. And then at six months, 
be Dr. Hip in six months. And that's when, that's because you first get the influenza vaccine at six months. At one year, you're gonna have a mad baby, okay? So babies get a little bit crazy, start moving around a little bit more. We'll talk about that more. But that's why we're gonna remember mad. That's the first time we give them their measles, mumps, and rubella. So remember that the measles, mumps, and rubella is a live or attenuated vaccine, as is hep B and So you, you just want to kind of keep that in mind for patients who are immunocompromised. The varicella is your herpes zoster and, um, and you're going to start giving that. At one year it's two doses. The happy is three. That's going to always be true. The DTAP just kind of continues until the end of time, until it turns to Tdap. And then we have the recommendation for HPV at 11. Okay. And this slide is just kind of looking at the different milestones that your baby will go through. And this is really important because they're gonna ask so many, so many questions on it. And if you're like me and you don't have any babies of your own, this can be a little bit challenging. So I just want to keep in mind, you know, not looking at a chart or anything, what the three really big high yield milestones are gonna be. So here's a newborn. The newborn is not doing anything. They're just kind of, they might be cooing at you. They're not crawling. They're not walking. They're not talking. They're just really cooing, sleeping. That's it. So then the next big milestone is six months. Well, I don't even know if a baby is a milestone, but uh, let's, let's pretend that it is. Then the next big thing is six months, and six is for sitting. So we have this cute, cute baby up here, and this baby is sitting. At six months, they're gonna be having some stranger danger, some um, stranger anxiety, so I put this little sticker here. And that's to show that they're really going to be able to differentiate a stranger from a parent. And they like to be with their parents. So your six-year-old should be sitting. Then the 12-month, 12, 12 one-year-old baby should be standing and walking. So if you know that the baby kind of, the newborn does nothing, the six month old sits and is scared of strangers and the 12 month old should be standing and walking. Also the 12 month old should be seeing mama and dada. So we kind of know what should be going in between here. So in between newborn and six months should be crawling, right? In between six months and 12 months, we have these, I almost put a picture of this, but I didn't. Um, seems kind of dangerous. We have these little push cart things that that babies can use and don't, you know, obviously don't recommend that because it is very dangerous. Babies can fall down the stairs and all kinds of things like that. But when you're planning your anticipatory guidance, just be cognizant of, you know, six month old sitting, 12 month old seeing you walking. And then I went ahead and put a picture of um, there's a pretty funny Jimmy Fallon book, and it's called Your First Word Will Be Dada. So, Jimmy Fallon makes a book where all of the words are pretty much dada. Um, I thought that was pretty funny. And I have a bunch of six-month-old babies sitting and listening to this book because that's when, you know, if you if you tried to teach them this at 12 years, it would be too late. They would already be saying their first word. They should be already saying their first word by 12 months. Now, does that necessarily mean that the 12-month-old baby who is not saying words is speech delayed? Not necessarily, no. I think probably we'd consider more of a speech delay at, after a little bit longer. But at least we know that this is going to be the 
the time frame. Okay. And so I'm going to just go off the screen. Oops. Well, maybe I'm not. Um, so this is lead levels. Here's a nice, nice piece of lead. And why this is so important is we're going to be testing our babies for lead, especially when they come in for the head first program. So when they come in for their physical with the head first, you need to be screening for lead. And what you want is a level less than nine. Less, more than 15 is a concern. We don't really want it less than, more than nine at all, but more than 15 is definitely a concern. When we get over 70, we have some changes to the neurological system, so we want to definitely take care of those quickly. So sources of lead poisoning that you can consider with your children who come back with high leads. And it's going to be paint in homes built before 1970, lead contaminated soil, dust. There are some different kind of Hispanic remedies. I wrote them down earlier. Um, imported pottery, toys, and jewelry, stuff you can get from China can sometimes have lead. And let's see where I wrote it down. But there is There are some, some home remedies that can lead to sources of lead, so just be cognizant of that. Okay, so moving from there all the way to dyslipidemia guidelines. So these guidelines show that if you have um, coronary artery disease or coronary artery disease equivalent, diabetes, uh, LDL over 190, you have a high risk score, then we're going to want to get you on a statin. So in patients with diabetes and coronary artery disease, almost all of those patients should be on a statin. But we want to consider their levels as well. You definitely, definitely need it to be under 100 for those patients. In some of them, you want it under 70. In a person with no other risk factors, we need it under 190. So what do you give them? Well, it really depends on how much you want to drop the LDL. So if you have an LDL of 140, you need to get it to 70 you're going to need to consider a torvastatin or a suvastatin. Suvastatin is Crestor. If, for instance, you have a LDL of 120 and you need to get it down to 100, you could go with a pravastat, a low-dose pravastatin or lovastatin. The simvastatin is right there in the middle. And the lower that it is, the more likely that your patient's going to be okay with the side effects, which are muscle weakness. Not muscle weakness, muscle pains. Okay, so back to our kiddos. Um, one of the cancers that is more common in children is testicular cancer. So for that reason, we're going to definitely want to teach these kids how to do a testicular self-exam before age 15. At age, age 15 to 25 is when testicular cancer is most common, so we really want them taking care of that. Here I've got a 15-year-old and then I made him age to 25 to show that these are the ages that we want to be having our, our patients do that. For women in their 40s, we want to do a mammogram every year if they have some and this is a there is a little bit of disagreement on here but i don't think anybody would fault you for doing 40. 
if you had somebody who was younger and you wanted to, for whatever reason, check a level on them, what you should do is an ultrasound. And the reason for that is because women who are younger typically have more dense breast tissue and an ultrasound will pick up changes better in dense breast tissue. At age 45, there's a couple of things that we want to start doing yearly. One includes the stool, occult blood stool test. And what that, what's going to happen with this is the patient's going to take it home and put two pieces of stool on this paper and then bring it back to the office. We'll drop some acid on it and see if we can see any occult blood. I have never seen anybody do this, but it is one of those things on the exam that you do need to know about. And it, if you did this, it would be in lieu of a colonoscopy, which would really be much better. The next thing you want to start doing at age 45, but you don't have to do it yearly, is do a blood glucose test. Now, I just realized that this has an A1C, I guess, on it. Um, I'm not sure why that is, but we're going to want to do a blood glucose test starting at age 45. And you can do it younger, definitely, if they have risk factors, which I feel like almost everyone does. Okay, so those are just a few little things that you're going to want to remember for your boards. And good luck!